Looking to start a podcast but don't know where to begin? Look no further. The team at Dodge Media Productions has 20 years of experience as podcast listeners and observing the industry and eight years experience in podcast production. We can help you take your podcast from idea to fruition and we'll make the process seamless and easy. We'll help you with everything from recording and editing to hitting the charts on Apple Podcasts. So what are you waiting for? Contact us today and let's get started. DodgeMediaProductions.com You're listening to Dodge Movie Podcast. Your hosts are Christy and Mike Dodge, the founders of Dodge Media Productions. We produce films and podcasts, so this is a podcast about films. Join them as they share their passion for filmmaking. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dodge Movie Podcast. This is episode 166. Woohoo! Today we are talking about Some Like It Hot from 1959. We watched it for free on Max. It is by the director Billy Wilder, who also did The Apartment, which I believe The Apartment is also in our popcorn bucket of choices that Ooh. could come up this so, question. year. Is Billy related to Gene? No, I don't believe so. Okay. Uh, he also did Sabrina in 19... 19- Oh, no, I apologize. 1960 was The Apartment. 1954 was Sabrina. And before that, 1950 is Sunset Boulevard. So some pretty big hits. Some classics. Ooh, Sunset Boulevard? Yeah. The Nicholson film? No, no. What are you thinking of? I don't know. <laughs> Chinatown. Why did I think Nicholson was in Sunset Boulevard? I don't know. Okay. Well, see, that's why I didn't go to film school. I don't know this stuff. <laughs> right. Billy also wrote this with I.A.L. Diamond, and Mr. Diamond also wrote The Apartment. And mm. Robert Thorne is also credited as writer for this film. This film stars Marilyn Monroe as Sugar King Kow- Kowalski. No. Kowalski? No, it's not a ski. It's a C-Z-Y-K is the ending. Which? Maybe. Kowal- uh Sugar cane. <laughs> Sugar cane. <color. laughs> yeah. I, nobody's looking at her last name. Right. Tony Curtis uh, plays Joe. Jack Lemon is Jerry. George Raff plays Spats Columbo. Okay. Couple of things. Uh-huh. First of all, Spats is a really badass nickname. It totally is. And then he wears Spats yeah. to go with it. Of course. Haven't seen Spats in a while. I feel like he's named Spats because he wears Spats. Yeah. I don't, I think the name came after the spat. I, I'm willing to stipulate that's okay. most likely. Okay. Good. But I still think it's cool. Yeah, totally. I'm down with Who it. Who wears spats anymore? No one. No one. Why did they wear it? Was it to protect the shoes? My my, my guess make... is it's because you had spats like were easier ugly to looking socks. And so that they, yeah, you could dress up your ratty old shoes. shoes and socks yeah. by putting the spats on it. It made it look fancy. Yeah. Mike, you should bring back the spats. <sighs> I totally could. Could we, um, Shark Tank idea, TM. We, oh, yeah. <laughs> and we use um, rare earth magnets so you don't have to have the snaps. They just, you they want a reason on. to use those. <laughs> you always incorporate rare earth magnets in your Shark Tank idea because they're humorous by their very nature. <laughs> it's like some words are inherently funny. Rare earth magnets are an inherently funny <laughs> component of any product. <laughs> But I want you to come out with them for like tennis shoes, not dress shoes. Oh, yeah, of course. I want you to come out with spats for tennis shoes. That's right. And so we have a couple of lines like you can get it in your favorite sports team. Okay. So you could have your ducks or your spurs spats. See, they still are needed because 30 years ago when I was in high school, I don't know if I, it was just because we were poor, but I would buy white shoe polish to refresh. Clean uh, yeah, clean up my white yeah. tennis shoes, my cats. Yeah, but did you see, I, I, I had the branding opportunity as well, <laughs> right? Did you notice that? No, I was deep in my high school days with yeah, white yeah. shoe polish. See, because I'm thinking that's what Cuban's going to want. How can he can, How can he get his basketball team <laughs> a little bit more merch? So there's that, but then you can have like um, high-end ones for uh-huh. a night on the town. Uh-huh. They're like, they look like little tuxedos across where the laces would be. <laughs> Those would be your formal spats. <laughs> like Brennan's t-shirt. t-shirt. Yep. <laughs> See? I mean, this is, we are joking, but I'm thinking about maybe pitching this. This is a pretty damn good idea. Well, they can't be much different. Remember they, the lady had the, like, the little fake thing, sock that you put at the top of your boot? And they've oh, had yeah. other 
other ideas that involved yeah. like, oh, like dickies. You know, it's the dickie for your shoe. Dickies for your ankles? <laughs> Ankle dickens. <laughs> yeah. We we could have Scrooge themed one. Charles Dickens. Dickens. <laughs> okay. We are so way off course. Okay. Yeah. But it was fun. Um, the DP for this is Charles Lang. He did the Ghost of Mrs. Muir, Sabrina again, sh- and Charade in 1963. And Mr. Lang went to school to be a lawyer and then decided to go into show business. Good choice. Yeah. There's more pretty goyles in show business than law. I think Billy Wilder also went to school to be a lawyer, but maybe I'm getting them confused. Okay. The filming locations for this film was the Hotel Del Coronado um, stood in for the Florida hotel that they're supposed to be at, but... Now, I'm not an architect, yes. but I did notice that. I, I know. called it out it when we saw that. It is so iconic, yeah. that hotel. Even for me, I noticed is, that. Do you think it's because you lived in Southern California? I'd be curious nope. if other people would have recognized it. Oh, that's a good question. Maybe, uh, but I just felt like everybody would recognize it. It's so iconic, but you're, you're right. Maybe if you don't grow up on the West Coast, you don't. Now, fun fact, some folks think that Fantasy Island was filmed there, and it was not. It Ooh. was filmed at a different Pretty house, but not at the okay, Hotel Del Corner. but not there. Yep. And then it was also a studio lot in West Hollywood and MGM Studios, I'm sure, for a lot of the interiors were done there. I feel like some of the boat scenes were done on a giant tank in a studio somewhere. I think it's so amazing. I love those scenes when they show the big tank that yeah. they can sell for the ocean. It's crazy. Right. All right. The synopsis for this film is after two male musicians witness a mob hit they flee the state in an all-female band disguised as women, but further complications set in. Okay. I think if there were more big bands that were just all women, they would have stuck around a lot longer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, nothing against Glenn Miller, but all dames, that's a good look. You enjoy that. Oh, yeah. All right. Let's see. One, two, four taglines. Okay, good. Four to choose from. Not since Scarface. So much action. Not since the Marx Brothers, so much comedy. Not since the seven-year itch, so much Marilyn. Wow, somebody got the not since bug. (laughs) I think that's too many. Three too many. (laughs) Three too many. (laughs) It's like, okay, you like Scarface? Well, this is in (laughs) in that movie. This ain't that. Did you like the Marx Brothers? Ain't that either. Let's just name three big movies that this movie is not. Oh, that's awesome advertising. My next film is totally going to be that. Did you like Deadpool? Not since Star Wars has there been a film with this much. Yeah, I'm totally doing that. Okay, the next one is the most comedy ever made. The biggest comedy ever made. The hottest comedy ever made. <laughs> okay, also not accurate. Somebody was in for the threes. Yeah, and and, and the all caps. Okay. It doesn't really come across on, on the podcast, but those were in all caps. Yes. The movie Too Hot for Words. Oh, wow, this is bad. Okay. I'm hopeful the fourth one <laughs> I know. pulls the it out. The fourth one I think is going to appeal to you. Okay, all right. Here we go. Marilyn Monroe and her bosom companions. Tony Curtis and Jack Lemon. Oh, it's got Marilyn Monroe and bosom in this. Yeah. Winner. Not the bosoms you thought we were going to talk about. Oh, that's the bosoms I'm thinking about. Okay. Here's the answer to my question. Originally planning on becoming a lawyer, right. Billy Wilder abandoned that career in favor for working as a reporter for a Viennese newspaper. And that's so smart. Using this experience to move to Berlin, where he worked for the city's largest tabloid. He broke into films as a screenwriter in 1929 and wrote scripts for many German films. Uh oh. Until. The guy Adolf- with the funny haircut? <laughs> yeah. Came into power in 1933. And then Wilder immediately realized his Jewish ancestry <laughs> I was say, yeah. could cause some problems. And so he hightailed it to Paris. Not that much safer. And then the U.S., although he spoke no English when he arrived in Hollywood, he was a fast learner thanks to contacts such as Peter Lorre, with whom he shared an apartment, and he was able to break into American filmmaking. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm going back to that last tagline where it said 
bosom companions. And yeah. what 80s sitcom did I immediately compare this to? Yes, Bosom Buddies. So was the title of Bosom Buddies influenced by the tagline for this film? Well, it very well could be. Because yeah. up until... Because to me, the tone of Some Like a Hot and Bosom Buddies... Very similar. Is, is very similar. Yeah. So here's the thing. You can, I think if you're going to make a film about gents dressing as women, mm-hmm. you have, I see it three ways you can go. You can go completely realistic and then it's a darker drama, right? About the struggles of that person. You can go. Um, well, it doesn't have to be. What about Tu Wong Fu? That's what I was going to say. That's my upbeat. Oh, okay. That's the third, the second one where it is kind of dramatic, but it's lighthearted, right? Mm-hmm. There's a little comedy about, you know, what's the Wesley Snipes mm-hmm. with the big muscles? Mm-hmm. Or you go slapstick. And I think this one went slapstick. Mm, totally right? it did. So did mm-hmm. Bosom Buddies. Remember, not since the Marx Brothers. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's a movie this funny. It's the funniest ever, the biggest ever, the hottest ever. <laughs> All right. Kick us off with your pickup line. All right, Charlie. Is that the joint? Completely fails my test. The police <sighs> chief is asking if if uh, they have identified the speakeasy that is serving illegal liquor for their raid. So very, very niche time, right? There is, a, was it even, I mean, what, maybe a decade that alcohol was, was uh, prohibited there? Prohibition was a fairly short oh. time period. Well, this, yeah, <clears throat> this film was done in 1959, like 30 years, I thought. Wasn't it the 30s, the Prohibition? Oh, but this film was set in... Yeah, it was set back then. Prohibition was repealed relatively quickly, I think before World War II, easily. I take for granted the choice of making this film in black and white because I think arrogantly, I'll just say, or egocentrically, I see a black and white film, especially set in, like, before I was born, and I think, oh, well, that's the only choice they had. Right. But specifically, Billy Wilder chose to do this film in black and white, even though he could have done it in color for two reasons. One, he wanted to hearken the era that you were talking right. about. The, yeah. the Makes it seem older. The 20s. And then also, apparently, the makeup that they had to use for the gents m- made their skin kind of have a greenish tinge. And so they didn't look as attractive. And so that was the yeah. other reason he was like, well, let's make it black and white. And we have filmmakers today that choose to do black and white. But it's, I guess, you know, it's like, oh, okay. you know, my favorite movie, Blue Jay, is in black and white. There's no reason it has to be. I'd be curious to talk to Mark and why did he choose to make it black and white? Right. I thought you were going to say that your favorite movie that happens to be in black and white was Black Pool. But, uh, right. Well, I enjoy that one, too. Yeah. But you'll notice, um, if I recall correctly, uh, Blackpool, there is some color There's at the, at the end. very end, yeah. And, and, and I, of course, have my famous theory about black and white versus color for the audience. So, yeah, I, I think that my first guess when you said there's a reason is I wondered if it was the makeup for mm-hmm. the gents to make them look more realistic, if that just helped. They did a screen test and they saw, oh, they look better in black and white. Mm-hmm. Was there anything else that you noticed of the cinematography? Because I just the when I when I read that trivia that he chose to do it, I was like, oh, I just assumed. But then I stopped and thought about it, and I was like, no, there was tons of color movies then. Well, I I had four things that I made note of under cinematography. One, which also might have been easier in black and white, was they did a day for night at the Hotel Del Coronado. There's a scene where it's mm. nighttime and they're running around, and it's pretty obvious it's day for night. But the wet pavement, I think, helps sells that. And down there, it never rains. So they had some poor PAs with garden hoses out there for an hour before right. they shot. There was a whip pan from the yacht to the Cuban club. And I don't recognize that in that era. That just caught my eye. I don't know. Maybe it was more common. I just didn't notice it. There was a nice ECU of spats. Spats. Yes, there was. So I remember help the. The audience connect who's who's the Spets guy we're talking right. about. But my favorite on this was when we were first introduced to Marilyn's character, Sugar Kane. It's outside the trains and she's walking away from the camera and the cameraman lovingly frames and follows her caboose. Mm-hmm. Ah, okay. See how you did that? See how I did that? Butts and seats. Yeah. 
Part of me has like a sad, you know, it's kind of... Oh, yeah. <laughs> just because... They were so much more upfront about it than they would be now, right? Well, what do you mean? About, we're just going to zoom in on our butt. I mean, I think that's done today. I was listening to a podcast today about a child star who was complaining that her mother had to go in and say, you're not going to zoom in on her butt, or you're not going to start on her butt and then zoom out. So, so I mean... I'm thinking of... They did it with Reese Witherspoon in Walk the Line, but it was less obvious. This was, I mean, it would be called fan service if it was like a a YouTube video, right? They were just right up front about it, right? You know, and I presume Marilyn knew that the sex appeal was a large part of what they wanted in that role, but it was just, you know... Like it, it, it caught my eye because it was so shameless. Definitely. I mean, <laughs> when she's hurrying to get on board the train. So I guess what's tough for me is during this time, Marilyn was extremely struggling with drugs and alcohol and she had had an ectopic pregnancy. Oh. She had had another m- multiple failed pregnancies with Arthur Miller and, and she didn't, like that her character was just like the dumb blonde. She was tired of that being her Mm -hmm. stereotype Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. um, typecasting that they did to her. And so, and when, and she had worked with Billy Wilder before on the seven year itch. And right after that film came out, they both said they'll never work with one another again. (laughs) And so, but because she was struggling, she had just had the ectopic pregnancy And Arthur Miller said he read in the trades that Billy was working on this film. And he said, why don't you call him up and see if he'll think about you? And so she did. And he said, you know, yeah, I'll I'll cast you because they were looking for a female lead. And the scene where that you're talking about where she's hurrying on board, a few blasts of steam pass closely by her backside And many people feel like it's a nod to the famous subway great scene that she did from the seven year itch. Mm -hmm. And it was, there's like this whole torrid her and I'm just going to dish on some Hollywood gossip that I hot goss. Yeah. That I heard on a video. So her and Tony Curtis had a love affair long before Arthur Miller and it kind of went hot and heavy. And then they decided like, okay, let's just like be friends. Let's, not do this. And so then she went on to marry Arthur Miller. Apparently on this film, she came to Tony's room and they got it on again. And it is said that it's possible that she got pregnant and she's pretty sure it's Tony's kid, not Mm. Arthur Miller's kid. Awkward when it has really good acting chops, but can't write (laughs) to save its life. Right. Can't um, hum a tune or (laughs) tone to... So, but she lost that baby also. So the poor dear, I guess. So I guess when you say like, at least they were upfront about it. I don't think they were like, Hey Marilyn, we want to hire you just for your tits and ass. I don't think that they were that upfront about it. Oh, well, I, I don't know. Is, you know, I, I didn't work back then. My, my only exposure is, is basically movies of producers, but they seem to be, um, not the most delicate or gentle people. Right. So I would have thought they would have been very blunt. It was just not right, but I think that was kind of how it was done then. Yeah, you're right. Maybe they would have told her, but I think, I don't think so. I think they were just like, oh no, we want you to be in our film. That's true. I mean, the Hollywood, yeah, they, they, they smoothed her to get her in the film. Right. But she was a big star then, right? And obviously she wasn't a dummy, so she knew that sex appeal was a big part of her kind of persona, right? And this film... It's not just her. I mean, the, the whole, whenever you have, like, with Bosom Buddies, you have the gents dressing as women. There's the whole, they get to run around with all the girls and they're unmentionable. That's mm-hmm. part of the, the slapstick kind of humor. So there were other ladies in bathing suits and lingerie and stuff. I mean, there's the whole bit with Jack Lemon in his bunk and they come to have, like, we're going to drink and he's like, Whoa. you know. So, I mean, there's that Trying part. not to have a reaction. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mr. Olivier. That that's that's part of kind of the setup, right? Is at because they were in drag, they get to go kind of behind the curtain. They get to see women in a more relaxed setting. And I I don't know if it's the same way 
for girls, but for boys, that idea of being able to see them when they're kind of let their hair down quite literally was very titillating. So yes, that's part yes. of part of the appeal, I think, of this of this premise. No, you're definitely right there. I'm thinking when you said that the reverse isn't always necessarily true. Mm-hmm. Like there was was it called just one of the guys? Oh yeah, Amanda Bynes, right? No. Well, there was one in the eighties. Amanda Bynes, I think, was in one similar yeah. to the one I'm thinking of. Okay, okay. But the actress that was in the one I'm thinking of was kind of like you never really saw her again. Okay, I think she secret, looked like I, Terry. I think it's here in my head. Yeah, yeah. I started to say Terry Polo, but that's Hatcher? not her name. Is that who was in um, Real Housewives? I thought or, it was Terry Hatcher. Yeah, um, Desperate Housewives. I meant to say not Real Housewives. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Terry Hatcher was. She looked like Terry Hatcher with like that short, like pixie cut. Yeah, the bob. Yeah. And when she was kind of imitating the boy, or you know, yeah, yeah, she was pretending. She to was be like one. grossed out to go in like the boys' locker room, whereas, like you said, I think a boy mm-hmm. would in the girls is it's titillating, it's exciting. Like you're you're in the forbidden area. Yeah, I, I don't know. I was never a teen girl, but I, I whether I mean that was a movie. Because, like, do, boys do snot rockets and they pee in the shower and... Okay, I don't know what kind of Philistines you had at your <laughs> high school, but we were cultured gentlemen. Okay, well, I didn't go to private school. Maybe that's the difference. <laughs> well, actually, we didn't have showers, so none of that stuff was... But, I, um, but you're right. I was trying to yes and you. And, oh. and so that is... We get off topic a little bit, but it, I think it is pertinent because at, at its oh. heart, this film is about gender and you know sexual roles and and who you um, fall in love with right and so there's a great line presaging the future in there where tony curtis says something like why would a guy want to marry a guy Mm -hmm. which in today's day and age of course lands differently because we've had some other activities as a society that that we've tried to deal with that question Mm -hmm. but in this case in that era that was much more taboo, pushing boundaries to have these two guys dress as a woman. And of course, we weren't very sensitive to trans people back then, but we know now that passing is a lot of work and it's more than just, you know, you put on a dress yeah, and heels, a wig and yeah. right? And what are the, the way people react? And in this film, right, for comedy, of course, Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon are unrecognizable to people who know them and no one seems to suss out. So for them, it's this almost seamless transition between the two roles, Joe and Josephine or whatever their names Mm -hmm. are. And they go back and forth with very easily and almost quickly. In fact, there's a little bit of, you know, running through the hotel rooms humor about how quickly they can transition from one to the other. Um, So in that sense, I think it's farcical or it's fantastical but it still pushes with the boundaries. And then the, the, the last line that you're telling me that was famously like, I'm a guy. Well, nobody's perfect. I would assume that in 1959, that was incredibly subversive. Right. Whereas yeah. nowadays that just plays this a funny line. Right. 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 Yeah. It was just a fill in line and then they couldn't really think of anything better. So it stayed in. And yeah, you're right. The idea that Jack Lemon was just like, okay, I guess we're going to, we're going to live together. Yeah. Osgood. So this was based on Billy Wilder wrote the script and the plot was based on a screenplay by Robert Theron and Michael Logan, a French film called Fanfare of Love. And the original script of Fanfare is untraceable Walter Mirsch found a copy of the German remake, Fanfares of Love, and he bought the rights to that script and Wilder worked with this to produce the new story. Both films follow the story of two musicians in search of work, but Wilder created the gangster subplot that keeps the musicians on on the run. On the run. So speaking of musicians, I think it to me was very obvious that all of the ladies band members really knew how to play their instruments. Yes. I don't know if Marilyn played the uke on her own. Probably um, not. Based on she had trouble getting the lines out. <clears throat> the question was if Curtis and Lemon played their instruments, the sax and the bass, 
I don't think so, but yeah. I don't want to uh, slander them if they if they did. I, I but I do like that when um, when they play the instrument. And in our next film coming up, uh, several of the actors learn to play an instrument for their role, and I appreciate that commitment to the role. Definitely. So I guess part of this film has such a you know I just have a sad feeling I guess when I think of this film because I think we looked it up. She died like within three years, I think. Yeah, of making... two or three years after this film. It was uh, very sad. And again, this is much like previous one that she was in. I knew Marilyn Monroe as a sex symbol, but she died before I was born. Mm -hmm. And so I only kind of knew those static curated images. Mm -hmm. And watching in this film, I got it, right? Like, oh my gosh, she really was... A sex symbol. I totally, you know, oh, I can see how it, if this was the current film playing in theaters, people would be like, wow, like I think of the Roger Rabbit, the eyes, you know, mm -hmm. um, and also the pressure of that, though. Right. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, uh, Sandy Bullock's America's Sweetheart, you know, uh, there's probably pressure that comes with people having considering you the paragon of some sort of role when we were talking about. With our next film, the one of the lead actors was concerned about being typecast, right? And, and that, you know, that comes for a reason. That's not just all up in their head. So I think as a youngster, right, I, you know, you hear Marilyn Monroe, you hear the the horrible kind of, you know, last years of her life. And, and it doesn't land, but now as an adult, having a bit more experience and having seen more people with addiction and trauma and yeah, it, it, it is hard to watch her in any role and not think of how sad those last few years were. Mm -hmm. You you were talking about them passing and they both got, you know, hair and makeup and they went out into the commissary and went into the ladies' bathroom and they said everybody was just like, oh, hello, girls. You're like, nobody noticed that they were huh. two gents. Then very good acting on their part. <laughs> Did you notice that when Tony Curtis was presenting as a male, when he was trying to woo Sugar right. Kane, that he had a certain vocal styling? Y yes, did he, he remind did. you of anybody? I thought he was doing a Cary Grant impersonation. He was. And apparently when they screened the film for Cary, he said... I don't talk like that. <laughs> <laughs> Jokingly, he knew he was. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'd heard that Wallace, Sean from uh, Princess Bride, inconceivable, yeah. doesn't hear that himself is different. So when people come up and, and quote the line to him, he, he, he didn't hear it as making fun of him because he thought they just sounded normal. I don't know if that's true or not, but that I heard that. Yeah. So. The film was produced without approval of the motion picture production code, the Hayes Code, because it featured the cross-dressing. The code had been gradually weakened in its scope since the early 1950s, owing to a greater sense of tolerance for taboo topics in films, but it was enforced until the 1960s. The overwhelming success of Some Like It Hot is considered to be one of the reasons of the retirement of the Hayes Code, which... Good job, guys. I know. Kudos to them for getting rid of that. There's an urban legend that the filmmakers chose a ukulele for Marilyn Monroe's character to play because holding small-scale instruments with both hands made her breasts look more attractive. Oh, that sounds right on par mm. for producers of the era. Yeah, you were yeah. saying. Yeah. Get her a tiny guitar. We don't really have, normally have a section for stunt work, and maybe we should. Mm -hmm. But my question was, did Marilyn do all of her own bike riding? There's a scene where her character is riding a bicycle, and especially if, if she was pregnant at the time, maybe shouldn't be riding a bike. That qualifies as stunts to me. But what's really impressive is, did Tony Curtis do all of his climbing stunt work to get in and out of the hotel? That looks pretty pro. I mean, this was before parkour and, and like rock walls. He was pretty pro. Yeah. So credit to him. Although I recall correctly, at least in his early years, he was known for his athleticism. So uh, maybe he did his, his own stunt work. Yeah. All right. Was there any head trauma in Some Like It Hot? 
So Osgood Fielding the Third gets slapped by Daphne after getting fresh in the elevator. And then um, Sugar gets tripped by Shell Oil Jr., which is Tony Curtis's, uh, one of his, right. his characters, <laughs> and she falls in the sand. So this reminds me of kind of like how elementary school boys, you know, if they like a girl, they punch her or trip her. Right. They're like, good yeah. work, guys. Yeah. And we got some smooches. Smoochy, smoochy, smoochy. We did have some smooches. Sugar smooches Shell Oil Jr. to convert him. Because he is pretending that he is not interested in the ladies. And then she also smooches Joe as they boat away. <laughs> she was a little prescient. Yeah. <laughs> Conversion therapy. <laughs> How about a driving review for something like that? There's a lot. We open with a running gun battle in downtown where the uh, mobsters have um, fully automatic 45 ACP weapons and the police are firing wi- at will with reckless abandon back at them. So the police have shotguns. Those pellets don't travel as far. But the mobsters? I mean, those bullets are going through houses. That was a remarkably unsafe thing. So I'm glad that we're trying to convince the police to not have high-speed running gun battles in, in the middle of downtown anymore. I don't know if the gun racks were standard equipment on that funeral coach from Studebaker. Mm-hmm. I think I kind of feel like that's an aftermarket. Great stunt driving, but I don't know with those narrow tires if that hearse could really make the turn at that speed, right? I mean, those are a tiny contact patch. Right. Bias ply, not really your racing equipment there. That 29 Duesenberg is a perfect car for a mob boss. And as you found, um, that particular vehicle is perhaps one of the most filmed cars of all time due to coincidence, but it was used many, many times. Notice that in the garage where they, um, where they end up killing Toothpick. So I guess back then, your mechanic would also rent parking stalls, it seemed like. Note the cars were backed in. Mm-hmm. It's not a modern invention. It was smart all the way from back then. <laughs> There's a, a line of dialogue where they said her father was vice president at Hup Mobile. And I have to say, I had to look this up. There is a Hup motor car company. I'd never heard of this before. So if there's a listener who's familiar with the Hup Motor Car Company, please feel free to write in and castigate me for not knowing that. And then it's not quite a car. But my question was, do motorboats have a reverse? I don't think they actually do. Well, it depends. Like a ski boat has reverse, doesn't it? I think I think in 1929, motorboats didn't have reverse. Okay. I think you would need the jet boat to go in reverse. I think if you had the propeller... You wouldn't go in reverse. I don't know. I'm not a not a boat person, but it looked to me like they were towing the boat backward mm. to make it look like it was going. It was backward. going in reverse. Yeah, yeah. but All it was right. it was necessary for the script, so they did it. Okay, shall we go to the numbers? Let's go to the numbers. So Monroe actually worked for ten percent of the gross. I feel like I did know why, but it, in excess of four million dollars, Curtis got five percent, so he got over two million. And Wilder for 17.5% of the first million after they broke even. And then 20% after that. Wow. I know. He did pretty well. Yeah. So some like it hot gross 14 million in the U.S. According to uh, the website I use the numbers, the film ultimately grossed 25 million in the U.S. And as of 2020, it had grossed over 83.2 million internationally. One of our co-hosts had to move. Or upon its original release, Kansas banned the film from being shown in the state, explaining that cross-dressing was just too disturbing for Kansasans. Wow. <laughs> I didn't know that Kansans were so, like, <laughs> incapable of handling a guy dressed as a gal. Right? <laughs> so this is kind of, this film is voted on the AFI's what list it's number one on the list of the hundredth most funniest films of all time in 2001. Hmm. All right. The other numbers that we normally do, it did have a budget of 2.8. And like I said, it almost nine times that budget making 25 million. It gets an 8.2 out of 10 on IMDb. It, critics give it 95% and audience audiences follow suit at 94%. It is two hours and one minute and like we said it passed the rating board it did not get an actual letter rating um that 
system wasn't in effect yet. It's labeled as a comedy music romance film. And the studio is Ashton Productions and the Mirish Corporation. It won one Oscar for best costume design, which oh, kind of makes sense right, if yeah. you're dressing up the, the gents. Yeah, first uh, kind of drag queen mm-hmm. film, so they should win. It won 11 other awards and 13 nominations, some of those being it won a Golden Globe for best motion picture and Jack for best actor and Marilyn for best actress. All right, shall we see what we're going to watch next week? Okay. The sound of music. Oh my gosh, you're in heaven. We are going to be singing The Hills Are Alive forever. (laughs) It's such an earworm in this house for some reason. Fun fact, if I was ever on Lip Sync Battle, one of my uh, possible candidate songs to lip sync is how do you solve a problem like Maria? Would you don like Allah. absolutely wimple and everything? <laughs> wimple, what's that? It's, it's is the, that what the, you the call thing, the? I think that's the, the part. Uh, yeah, the, the the part of the headgear. I don't know if it's the whole headgear, but I like the name Wimple. Yeah. Okay. No, I would totally dress as a nun. Well, I think we need to invite Mike to a, a costume party so that he can. Now that I think about it, that is kind of the perfect costume for me because it it's really... nice and flowy. Very flowy, and you know the words. Oh, goodness. (laughs) Yeah. All right, stay tuned, everybody, for the sound of music. The sound of mic. (laughs) Good one. All right, everybody, have a great weekend. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and never forget... Dodges never stop, and neither do the movies. Thanks for listening to Dodge Movie Podcast with Christy and Mike Dodge of Dodge Media Productions. To find out more about this podcast and what we do go to dodgemediaproductions.com. Subscribe, share, leave a comment, and tell us what we should watch next. Dodges never stop, and neither do the movies. 